Right, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, the first in our series of lectures about the trauma Katie ambush and especially uh, Professor Liam Heffernan. I hope you enjoy the lecture and uh, I'll leave, let the professionals talk now. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we've started put to our, our lectures. Uh, welcome listeners and viewers to the commemorative series of the Michael O'Brien Lectures, uh, the Michael O'Brien Educational Lectures. Uh, these are a, a core part of our commemorative year to um, commemorate the Tormakidi ambush in this the centenary year. Uh, this is the inaugural lecture, and uh, we've gone to North Mayo for our speaker. Um, he's a historian, a writer, and a few more feathers in his cap as well. Uh, he's written extensively on the War of Independence in North Mayo, and he has researched the War of Independence all over Mayo and indeed other parts of the country. So we are welcoming Liam here this evening to present the inaugural lecture, and we're going to hand over the floor to Liam Heffern of NUIG History Department. Liam. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so um, just before we start, um, I just want to make sure that when you're recording, you're getting the webinar. So I suggest if um, just for the, for the purposes of this, if you could um, hide your video, um, just that it just when you're recording, then the webinar will um, basically record to everyone else. So if you could all do that, that would be great. And um, and in the meantime, I will just talk about myself. Um, first of all, can you all see me? Okay, am I front of screen? Yep, thank you, okay. So, um, let me just start here now. So, um, as Joe said, um, I am a historian at NUI Galway, not quite a professor yet, thank you, Tomas, but head in that direction, I hope. I have written on the War of Independence, as Joe mentioned, in North Mayo. And I, as Joe also mentioned, I have studied the War of Independence in the West of Ireland in particular. And um, this lecture I'm giving tonight, this webinar, I want to keep it as informal as I can, but it's basically about um, that particular topic. So um, I will answer some questions at the end. Um, so if you have any questions, be sure and note them down and ask them at the end. And if I've said anything really egregious, by all means, bring it up um, at the end as well. So I'm going to share my screen with my um, PowerPoint presentation. So up we come here now. So this, uh, one second, um, play from start. Okay, here we are. So um, just one second, now. sorry. This never goes right when you're trying to do it uh, uh, for real. So bear one second, sorry, no. We start again, play from start. Okay, so um, the title of the lecture that I'm going to give you the next 40 minutes is called The Men of the West, the IRA in Mayo 1919 to 1921. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to give this inaugural lecture. Um, this is not a narrative of events. This is about understanding the background and context for the reasons why these men, and in this case, we're talking about the, the men who took to fighting the Crown forces during this period, um, just over a hundred years ago. And um, my intention is to give some color as regards as to why they did it and what happened as they were doing it. So, um, one second. The, my, 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 my surprise people is that this is, would be the contemporary view of what was going on in the West during the War of Independence wasn't necessarily very flattering. Um, Ernie O'Malley, who is from Castlebar and became a very noted Republican leader, he was very less than impressed, very much less than impressed with Michael Kilroy, the West Brigade commander. And he can see there in the quote where he claims that Michael Kilroy was always talking as if the West had been fighting all the time, where in O'Malley's view, it wasn't until April or May 1921 before a policeman was shot. And that's what he considered a war. More pointedly, the Antogluck, which was the volunteer journal, during September 1920, this is actually what they printed, which was more or less that the fact that the West of Ireland didn't feature in 
intense attacks against Crown forces. Now that the Crown forces were engaged in very severe retaliation, the journal said, tough luck, you have it on yourselves. You didn't do enough earlier on in the campaign, so now you're reaping the reward. So that's quite a harsh critic or critique of what was going on in the West of Ireland. And so the impression is the West of Ireland was actually quite during this period of time until later on, 1920, 1921. So we'll investigate maybe why that's the case. But bear that in mind, because the War of Independence that started in 1919 doesn't mean that the West of Ireland necessarily saw much fighting until much later. When we look at um, 1918, and the significance here is that you're heading into what's commonly, if you ask anyone, when was the War, Irish War of Independence? People generally say 1918, 1919 on to 1921. Well, looking at February 1918, we have the RSC Chief Inspector Steadman, and he's writing from Castlebar to headquarters. And each county, in some cases like Tipperary there too, had inspectors who would every month send in the reports to headquarters about what was going on. And so Dublin Castle knew what was going on in each little village throughout the whole country. And the RSC, because of through their constables throughout the beat throughout the country, they knew intimately what was going on in every single parish in every single village. And in this case, you have Stebman reporting that um, because the wartime boom, because obviously 1918 saw um, the last year of the World War I, you had a, a series of situations where people who had farms were doing quite well because they were able to export their produce to the UK who needed it badly because of, of the war going on. So if you had enough land, you were actually in a boom. And what Steadman here reported was such farmers are doing very well. In contrast that you had laborers and poor people who weren't. So you saw during World War I, um, a gap opening up between the haves and have nots in rural Ireland. And that's significant for, for later on. The next thing that happened in 1918 is and essentially as Steadman here calls it, a bolt from the blue. And this more than anything else helped the Republican cause where the government in London threatened to bring in conscription to Ireland. And you can see the consternation that Steadman had because he knew this was not something that was going to go well. And what essentially happened was the Catholic Church led the way, but basically all nationalist Ireland came together. And up to that point, Sinn Féin was regarded as an extreme party. But in this case, they brought them all in together under the one umbrella in opposing conscription. And this did two things. One, it brought Sinn Féin in from the cold and made them respectable. They now shared, um, literally shared stages with the Bishop of Tum and the Bishop of, of uh, Kilala, for example. You had national school teachers, trade unions, and the old Irish party all on stage with Sinn Féin. And that made a big difference because suddenly now Sinn Féin was, as I said, respectable. And secondly, because Sinn Féin were the most extreme opposition to the um, uh, conscription, Many people joined them because they wanted to basically protest against conscription and sons and daughters of farmers joined because they didn't want to uh, join the British war effort. So that had a huge measure and that happened in uh, April 1918 is when that threat was coming in of conscription. Follow on through till the end of the year. So you had the, the 1918 election in December. And essentially this, you may have seen this map or something similar to that before. Sinn Féin whitewashed or greenwashed the uh, map of Ireland. And you can see there how they dominated uh, almost every single constituency to a lesser or greater extent. The Home Rule Party, as described there, um, was complacent. Essentially, if you think about it, the Home Rule Party thought that Home Rule is one. They had a bit like the SDLP in the North, perhaps. They, fake, they, they had basically achieved what they set out to achieve, which was Home Rule. It was only a matter of waiting till World War I is over and Home Rule is going to kick in. Secondly, because many of the supporters of the Irish party were those prosperous farmers, they were busy out farming. They were busy with their crops, busy with their cattle and sheep. So they had no time for um, politics. And the end result was a very complacent, almost dead, zombie-like Irish party. In South Mayo, they couldn't even put up a candidate. So William Sears won it without any opposition. So that just shows you um, the level of complete um, the, the routing that, that Sinn Féin did wasn't necessarily down to everybody supporting them. It's down to the fact they had no opposition. And that's significant. 
Also, if you notice there on the map, and again, I'll, I'll give this um, slideshow to you afterwards, you can see that in many constituencies, Sinn Féin didn't get above 50% of the vote. And because it's first past the post system, they automatically win. If it was proportional representation, it would be a different matter. So that's another thing to take into consideration. So there obviously is a non Sinn Féin vote there that you cannot see in the results of the election. But nevertheless, in this case, because it's first past the post, Sinn Féin wiped the slate clean and they essentially become by far the dominant um, party in the whole island um, um, to a huge extent. So who were the, the, these Republicans? Now, the photograph you have there is actually of R.I. Seaman and the reason why I put that in there. But essentially, William Sears, who was the uh, Sinn Féin uh, MP for in elected um, in, the, in the 1918 election for South Mayo. And here he is uh, up in North Mayo, up in Bangor, and he's given one of his electioneering. Now, this isn't a normal Michael Ring uh, electioneering, as you can read it. He's basically saying, um, you all remember Rory of the Hills uh, during the land league times. And he's out busy shooting landlords and agents and bailiffs, but he missed a good few of them. And now the time has come to pick up where they left off. This is an MP. So this, and this is his electioneering. And William Sears uh, was quite uh, violent in his language, but he wasn't the only one. So what the Republicans are doing, they were reaching back to the Land League and drawing on that tradition of opposition to landlords, but also working that in then to opposition to the British state. On the left-hand side, you can see there that photograph is of some regular RIC men. And what you need to remember is RIC men were a little bit like Gardaí of today in that they were Catholic uh, in the main, they were pretty much bedded in the community, and they also were not um, army. These were, I said, these were police. So that needs to be remembered that when uh, we we'll go forward, we'll talk about that. But they're the normal people that every day are used to this for over 100, almost 100 years. They're used to this police as being their, their local policeman. So they would know them by, by name and know them um, very well. So anyway, what William Sears is asking for is, it's time we got busy shooting them. So he was saying it, how many people actually believed him at the time, it's hard to know, that was in 1918. But wait, to, wait till 1919 comes around. So while waiting for that, a couple of things that were going on in the background. So this is emigration from Connacht and from Mayo in particular. And you can see there, for the first time since before the famine, emigration stopped. This never happened since until very recent times, um, World War II had an impact, but not the extent where we have emigration stopped completely. You can see there, it started in 1914 and through to 1917, it just stops. So literally in Mayo and Connacht in general, there was no emigration. Now, here's the problem. Unlike today, County Mayo was a very rural county. There was three factories in the whole county. The bacon factory in Casabar, for example, the Foxer Woolen Mills, I think actually you mentioned there was a mention of the lace factory in Ackle. I can't remember the, the fourth one, but that's all. So essentially, if you've no employment, you have these people who normally would have emigrated are now hanging around um, the county and they've nothing to do. So keep that in mind. So the period 1917, 1918, going to 1919, there's a lot of people who would have emigrated. And how many people? You can see there in Mayo, there was two and a half thousand people leaving every year up until 1914. So you're talking about probably the guts of 30,000 people who haven't left. That's a lot of people who normally would have left and are fairly fed up with the fact they can't. So that's the thing to take in mind. What else, else is happening? I mentioned about the uh, wartime boom. We have a huge spike in the cost of living. This starts in 1850 and essentially it's inflation, essentially. But it's moving from 1850 to 1924. And you can see there the spike that occurred during World War I. And that had a huge impact. If you were selling stuff, if you had sheep to sell, cattle, crops, you were doing okay. If you had to buy stuff, that's a huge problem. And as the Stedman said earlier on, the poor were especially affected by this. So this was causing, I said, that divide between the haves and the haves nots, haves and have nots. Small farmers, another thing. Mayo, uh, this is a, a, a graph that I did, which basically shows the size of farm holdings in 1914, the outbreak of World War I. Now, if you remember, and some of you from your history will remember this, that Land League promised um, tenure. In other words, that, you could, that people could own their holdings. And that was seen to be a great um, resolution to the problem of land hunger in, in Ireland. Well, there's not much point in you owning your land if all you have is an acre. In fact, you're probably well off rent it rather than own it. 
because at least the landlord has has uh, he has to do things for you where if you own a one acre you have to do it yourself in this case you find that in mayo is the most extreme county when it comes to the size of the amount of, of small farmers they have more small farmers who own between 15 and 30 acres and way more that own between five and 15 acres so there's a huge number of small farms and most of these small farms are on poor land so you have poor small farmers and that is mayo is an extreme Galway, as you can see comes after that and then donegal but mayo by far is a, an outlier in that case so before i, I come to that so basically what you're talking about, you have a situation where in Mayo in particular, a lot of very small farmers, their sons and daughters who normally would have emigrated are now hanging around at home because they can't leave. Um, inflation has gone up and they're looking across the ditch at their, their bigger neighbours who are doing quite well. And if you have a small farm, you're not. So that's there's a lot of issues with um, poverty in Mayo at the time, hidden poverty in, in rural Mayo or in Mayo, I should say. Now, this is just taken from my own parish of Magauna, but this will be reflected in any parish, whether it's Daniil or Tumakidi or wherever, the age of Republicans. And you can see here that the average age in 1918 of the volunteer is just over 20 years old. The officer is slightly older, um, an average age of about 23. Um, the, the common amount, the women tend to be that a bit older. And the Sinn Féin leadership themselves, as you can imagine, they're, they're older again. Now, that's significant. If you think today of a 21 year old coming to your door with a gun and a bunch of his friends with them, asking you to, to contribute to the local IRA. What would you think? A 21 year old, a 22 year old. Um, a lot of the films show these uh, actors um, are in their 30s. But in actual fact, the IRA is quite young. And that's to be borne in mind. A lot of these, these are very young, these are young men who are going to a feature in, later on. So that's the average ages we're looking at there. So these are young people. Now, this is the occupation. And again, this is taken Magauna, but this could be any rural parish um, in Mayo. And by far and away, um, you can see there, small farmers, so the, the uh, volunteers, officers, the whole, lot, the whole lot of the membership of the volunteers, which became the IRA, they're drawn from small farmers. And that fits in what I just said earlier on, where you have small farmers who are fed up because of the way things are going, and also the fact that their sons and daughters can't emigrate. The U-boats, the blockades mean they can't emigrate. And conscription means they can't go to any, anywhere in the British Empire. They'll be conscripted. So they're stuck at home and they've nothing to do. And basically their, their, their choice is that they join the um, Republican movement. So essentially you see there, laborers, someone mentioned to me why laborers be so low. You can see only two laborers were joined in Morgana because laborers are busy every single day, every hour of the day. Uh, in many cases, and they also, they joined the ITGWU, they didn't join the Sinn Féin movement. So this is said to you is small farmers, sons and daughters. Now, this is showing um, the um, radicalization of these young people. So you see here back, this is a graph basically of the organizations that were uh, reported to the RSC in Mayo to Dublin Castle. You can see here, as it starts off in 1917, there isn't that many organizations recognized. But as you move forward, you see everything from the Sinn Féin clubs to Common Man, the Irish Volunteers, all set up. But also the GEA clubs get, start getting set up. The Gaelic League um, start getting set up as well. And what that does is you see a huge growth. You can see there of the, the, the GEA is um, a small component of that. But yet there will be a lot of all those clubs with a, a very high membership. Um, and they all happen in parallel with each other. So you have a Republican... Uh, movements drawing on different aspects, sporting, um, cultural in terms of the Gaelic League, uh, political in terms of Sinn Féin clubs. And then uh, allied to that, then you have the ITGWU also growing. And people think of the ITGWU now as maybe an urban centered uh, organization. At the time, it was growing in Mayo because it was the rural laborers that were joining. So this was rural laborers joining the ITGWU, which had different motivations to Sinn Féin, but both would consider themselves um, bed brothers, if you like, versus the the imperialistic crown um, of the UK. So you can see there, I said, and that's growing. And you see it's growing all the way through from 1918, all the way through to uh, 1920, and then through to um, 21. Now, so essentially, why did Sinn Féin um, do so well in the 1918, 1919 election? And you can see here, this is the reason why, I think most of you will rec recognize that gentleman there. Um, I'll give you prizes afterwards who it is. Um, the, 
Sinn Féin had a parish-based network. So basically they utilized the existing parish-based system of organization. This is something that was, uh, goes back to the Land League and, and beyond that. And it was youthful, very energetic, very youthful, using GA clubs, using Irish League um, um, clubs. And I said, building then volunteer companies, which are kind of, if you think of it this way, the Sinn Féin uh, club, the Sinn Féin club during the day was the IRA volunteer company at night. So that's kind of the best way, overlapping membership. Um, he said they shared kinship and uh, so, uh, there I mentioned overlapping membership. So basically they shared kinship with the GA. Not, the GA was, did its best to stay separate from the whole um, war of independence. They wanted to keep the GA going and try and keep it as apolitical as possible. But clearly they were a very Republican organization. And the mo by far the most important thing that happened was actually caused by the UK because they brought, the UK government brought in what was called the Representation of the People Act 1918. And you can see there, it gave, um, for the first time, gave all men over 21 and women over 30 the right to vote in parliamentary elections. And this now meant, considering that the Sinn Féin vote is a young vote, that every Sinn Féin man over 21 has a vote. And that immediately expanded the franchise. If they hadn't brought that in, Sinn Féin would not have won the landslide they did. So that's very significant. And the reason why the UK government brought it in was because those men um, were fighting in World War I and they were demanding um, you know, to be remembered or to be commemorated for, for that or to be rewarded for that. All the, all the things that Sinn Féin did as well, they, they had the radicalization included concerts and lectures. So basically you, you go to a lecture, but you really go to the concert afterwards. And there's many cases where young men were, and young women were going to lectures and they enjoyed the lectures and thought they were very stimulating talking about the martyrs of 1916. But of course, there was one eye looking out for Mary in the corner because Mary might be dancing at the concert afterwards. And, you know, I, I'm going for political reasons, but, you know, the, the concert is good crock too, you know. Um, so that was a very clever blend of that. And also at an era when even singing a ballad could get you in prison or could get you arrested anyway. Um, it's a risky thing. So if you're a young man and why wouldn't you be singing ballads in the middle of the night um, waiting for an RIC man to come around and clip across the ear until you go home? Because it's, again, it's a radical thing. So essentially what was happening that the, the Sinn Féin was, play, was a movement on the edge. It was risky. It was um, appealing to the martyrs. It was uh, inspirational. And I said, if you're someone who's stuck in Mayo, normally would have emigrated, of course you'd join. Why wouldn't you? Um, the opponents to Sinn Féin, and you can see here, are described by Stebman himself as unprepared and lethargic. So that's kind of the kiss of death. And you can see here, um, he even notes the conscription movement that when basically they were signing everybody up to oppose conscription, Sinn Féin made sure that they're going to keep hang on to these members um, where the Irish party just didn't um, do anything about it at all. So that's, you can see here where Steadman, again, as a, as a policeman has got his finger on the pulse, exactly what's going on. And in this case, that's why Sinn Féin were, I said they were cool, as I euphemistically call it, but they were lucky as well um, in, in that. Um, so while they were organizing politically, they're organizing militarily as well. And you see here, um, uh, Mayo was divided up into four uh, brigades areas, north, south, east, west, more or less along with the uh, parliamentary district or parliamentary constituencies. Um, they kind of didn't quite keep to the borders. Sometimes they went over the Mayo border into Sligo, into Galway, into Roscommon. Some didn't. So it's kind of a bit, bit loose. Um, but you can see there that that's pretty much it. So the timeline of the War of Independence, you can see here, the first dawn met on 21st January 1919 and declared an Irish Republic. Um, on the same day, by chance, you had a solo head, head beg ambush, which was seen to be the first shots in the War of Independence. Um, in Mayo, it wasn't until March, the two months later, where you had a killing of a magistrate in Westport called John C. Milling. Um, that was kind of out of the, out of the blue, really, because uh, he was shot, I believe, at night through the window of his house. And um, that was, as I said, seen, shocked people. People weren't expecting that. Um, through 1919, there not much else happened in Mayo from a, from a uh, and again, as I was alluded to earlier on by Anthogluck and by Ernie O'Malley. What you had was a lot of intimidation. You had a lot of, um, for example, RIC men were being held up and in some cases told to take off their clothes. Other cases were told they, uh, they better resign quickly from the RIC or they'd be um, shot. And letters were sent to RIC um, fathers of RIC men, uh, of boys who were thinking of joining, and you had um, things like that happening. 
So it wasn't necessarily that you saw much in the way of fighting. And that was uh, for 1919. What happened in 1920, in January 1920, you had a national IRA offensive. Michael Collins and Mulcahy decided it's time that we intensify this campaign. And it was decided from January 1920 nationwide, they're going to intensify the IRA campaign. And in Mayo, that meant essentially they started the campaign because it really up to that point, you didn't really have um, the obvious uh, examples of uh, fighting. Um, during 1919, um, some Republicans were actually very troubled by the fact that the that in Mayo that they weren't fighting. Patrick Hegarty, who was a former IRB leader and uh, became a, a very significant um, IRA leader as well, you can see what he called, he basically was giving out because he felt that the volunteers were focusing too much on, on politics. And as a result, um, they weren't concentrating on military um, attacks or military planning. And he blamed that on that. You see Dr. Crowley, who was the TD in North Mayo, and he was complaining in Kalala that um, you can see there, and for a, um, a GP who was very mild mannered, this, he obviously shows his frustration when he was saying to them, um, every uh, Irishman needs to be prepared to go out and fight to his last drop of blood in May 1919. So they're getting very frustrated with the fact that they saw in Mayo that they weren't actually um, you know, gearing up to the war to the Crown Forces. And um, that picture, by the way, is of uh, men during um, interned by in Curra Camp by the uh, Crown Forces from, um, that's just one of the, I think it's, uh, yeah, tin, I think it's Tin Town or would have been called Tin Town later. Um, also bear in mind in 1919, you had the World War I ended and the conscription threat obviously um, died away. Rep uh, if you remember, emigration increased again because now the U-boats are gone. And that had a huge effect then because um, you find that there was a leeching away of support for Sinn Féin. And the evidence of that is the municipal elections that happened in January 1920, which happened in Westport, in Casabar, and in Balana, Sinn Féin did very poorly, very poorly. In Balana's case, they came in fifth. So many Republicans were very worried by this, and they thought their chance had gone. And this was um, something had to be done. So um, Basically, what we had, we found essentially what Hegarty was complaining about, where the IRA were concentrating in politics rather than the, uh, the campaign, was swapped. Essentially, the ballot box was swapped for the gun in 1920. And you find that in the June 1920 elections, Sinn Féin got more, as one guy said to me, they got more real. Um, they essentially decided we're going to go for broke. And they ensured in 1920 there was going to be nobody opposing them in the election. So they had no contest. The local elections meant they swept the board again because nobody opposed them. Um, Mike Collins and the headquarters in Dublin sent out organizers, especially in areas of the West where weren't active. They sent out organizers. Now, the police call said they were there to cause trouble. What they were doing was they were organizing and getting these brigades set up properly and talking to the likes of Tom McGuire and Michael Kilroy about being able to organize their men better and to plan attacks and, more importantly, to try and get the resources and guns necessary for it. Um, and they started talking to the ITGWU in order to help them make the country ungovernable, as they say. So you had, for example, uh, train drivers stopping trains, boycotting trains, refusing to carry troops from Dublin to, to the West, for example. Um, you had boycotting, intimidation and burning of barracks. Um, the RIC became very demoralized. But going back to the earlier picture of the RIC, you can imagine your ordinary RIC man who's in Ballinrobe or he's in wherever he is. And he's normally used to you know, saying hello to people, going around his daily duties, looking at trying to find a dog license or whatever it might be. And suddenly now he's getting letters threatening him that he will be shot if he doesn't re uh, resign. Um, his family are getting threats themselves. They're being boycotted. They're being ostracized. They go to church. No one talks to them. They go to the shop. No one will serve them. Um, so ordinary RSC becoming very intimidated. And then barracks start to be burnt down. Now, initially, the IRA tell the, anyone in the barracks to get out. They don't actually kill anybody. They burn the barracks. But again, that demoralizes the RSC. And they start to withdraw. So smaller barracks start to close down and they start to withdraw to the bigger towns. And what that means is the Republicans now have the countryside to themselves and they, they bring in their own police, which are essentially the volunteers become the police. Go back to the 21 year old. So that 21 year old who comes to your door is now the policeman, whether you like it or not. And that's what's happening. These men have now become the police and the Sinn Féin courts are set up. And these court systems are very revolutionary. Because unlike the court, the petty sessions and what we know now is our court system, these were parish-based courts. In some cases, they were in sheds, they were under bridges, they could be anywhere. 
and you had the local IRA or Republican leaders or the Sinn Féin leaders who were appointed judges. Now, generally, they tried to make them exceptional men that people all recognize were good, were good men. And they're all men, unfortunately, no women. But they were, they were basically judges. And they decided whether, um, for example, I came across a Sinn Féin book which um, talked about a man who was beating up his wife. Nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with the, the struggle against the, um, the Crown forces. But they basically adjudicated on that and they ordered him to pay compensation to her and um, not to do it again. Again, well, it's, that's just what they did. That's how they handled it. But that's just an example of where they were forced to step in. And that happened all over the country because these courts obviously dealt with the day-to-day -day stuff. So we had people now engaging with this new republic, as De Valera called it. I think De Valera is supposed to have said, um, we defeat the British um, crown by ignoring it. And his idea was we set up our own republic. And again, if you're going for your dog license to the local um, IRA uh, courts or the Sinn Féin courts, then, then you've won essentially, because that's the ordinary day-to-day -day stuff that you're now doing in an Irish Republic. You can see here, the quote here, there's some Republican um, uh, in the picture there. Um, you can see the quote there is Steadman. He is very demoralized in 19, this is July, 1920. He's writing to headquarters and bear in mind, he's writing to his, his boss essentially. And he's saying that um, it's almost over, it's, it's finished. Um, in Mayo in particular, you can see here, Sinn Féin agents assault and harass the servants of the Crown. And when the opportunities present themselves, the, their officers are robbed and murdered. Railways are suspended. The resignations of police mean that few will remain in the coming winter. Military occupation will continue, but its days in these islands are numbered. Um, Stedman is literally saying it's all over. So that's, that's happening here. And that's July of 1920, he's writing. So what was going to happen? And this leads to a decision which have far reaching consequences. And it's a very controversial decision, even today. Down on the left-hand side, there are some black and tans, I think there are maybe auxiliaries. Um, during the course of August, September, 1920, the reason why we're not quite sure is because every single monthly report that was sent by every single county inspector to Dublin Castle is missing. They're not there anymore. I wonder why. But something happens because when October comes around, we suddenly find a change in heart. So I'll go to October here. This is what Stedman, so bear in mind July, what Stedman had been saying, it's all over, it's finished in Mayo, all over. Look what he's saying in October. A healthy sign of the times that the dread of the reprisals in the event of anything untoward happening in their locality is making people generally exercise their influence to prevent anything occurring in their midst that would likely bring in such in its train. This is rather a novel feature in Irish psychology. Now that's a very understated. What he's talking about there are known as reprisals. Essentially, if an IRA attack or ambush or anything happened in an area, the RIC, not just the Black and Tans, people think it's just Black and Tans, the RIC and Black and Tans and auxiliaries all had the option and did of going into that community and inflicting a reprisal, a punishment on the community for what happened. That could be the burning of a house. In fact, it frequently was. It could be the arrest of people. It could, it could involve um, more than that. In some cases, it was torture involved. Um, that wasn't supposed to be sanctioned, but it did happen. Um, but also, basically, they um, ensured that if an area, in some cases, for example, there was one little village, I think it was Kilkelly, I can't remember. And when the IRA had dug up the road, they forced everybody in that village to come out and fill in the holes. Even an old woman who was on her bed, she was actually very ill. She was forced to get out of her bed, bring a shovel and start in the, and in the rain, start shoveling in sand back into the holes again as a punishment. And the idea behind that was, well, if we punish the community, the community would think twice about allowing the IRA to do something in their area. And you can see how he phrased it. It's very chilling the way he puts it. This is rather a novel feature in the Irish psychology. I, I still get a chill actually when I, when I realize what he said. So if we go back here, one, essentially what you're seeing here is the reprisals are in full operation October. So sometime over August, September, 1920, the official policy was changed. And the encouragement was that the reprisals would happen. Some people blame Winston Churchill for this. Some people said it was a decision taken at the highest level of the British government. Um, either way, we're, we don't have a full um, fax to hand as to what happened. But these reprisals are war crimes. If there was a war, if unfortunately, again, the hair problem again, the, the, the Crown did not consider the war of independence a war. To them, it was criminal activity. 
But in reality, this de facto was a war crime because reprisals are a war crime. Along with that, they also had sweeping arrests. So they brought in special emergency legislation, which ensured that they could arrest people without um, unsuspicion. So they wholesale arrested people and uh, in, um, brought them into um, prison. Volunteers are forced to go on the run. And you find also, Mayo, actually people probably don't realize, Mayo lost the second highest, sorry, Mayo received the second highest number of British recruits, in other words, black and tans and auxiliaries. The second highest number in the country came to Mayo. And that's because they lost so many from resignations of RIC men who resigned because they weren't prepared to put up with the intimidation or some resigned in sympathy, but um, others didn't want the intimidation. So um, that situation meant that from the latter end of uh, 1920, the IRA were on the run, literally. And the RIC were euphoric. They thought we have them. When, it got, when they got to December, 1920, Stedman believes the IRA are finished. They're over, they're done. We've, we've, we've beaten them. And that's, as he saw it in the winter, that it's only a matter of time before the IRA are crushed completely. Um, the IRA decides to do something and they counter. This a combination of headquarters and the local IRA come together to plan a new offensive. And what we find here is the IRA harden and they become much more targeted, much more violent and much more um, cold in, in the way they're planning their operations. Now, bear in mind, the IRA are not nearly as well equipped as their, what their opposition. In many cases, you had the um, RIC patrols with black and tans, also with the military, also with the RAF in some cases, with much, their firepower is much higher than, than the IRA men. Frequently, all they had was shotguns. That's all they had. So you had a situation where they're out, out maneuvered in that regard. So they, they planned guerrilla style warfare, ambushes, that type of thing. So you ended up um, basically in January, February, up to July 21, you had murder gangs of R black and tans and auxiliaries in RIC. Now these, in many situations did happen, but the fear of them was greater than the reality, if that makes sense. So everyone had a story of a murder gang, but it, it could be the same bunch of um, it's a criminal elements of the RIC and black and tans. It wasn't necessarily a policy, but it did happen. So um, they were roaming the countryside. The Sinn Féin court system collapses because basically the RIC can literally, without any warrant, can literally go in and on suspicion, haul you out of your house. So they're able to close these courts down very quickly. People are very war weary. They've had um, this going on for the last number of years. Bear in mind, people are just the point now where they're facing into the post depression of the post World War I economy. And um, the weather is bad, turf is bad. Um, so people are very fed up uh, in general. You find the RSC going around in large patrols to try and ensure that they don't get attacked as easily. So um, the local companies of IRA are unable to target now RSC because simply there's too much firepower against them. So headquarters sent out agents again to local groups. Michael Cleary is one um, guy who went to North Mayo from uh, Bacon in near Ballyhonis, and he helps to organize. And basically what they say to the likes of Tom McGuire and that is the men who are forced on the run, who the RIC had forced to, to leave their homes, they're basically come together to form what's known as active service units or later called flying columns. So these flying columns were organized in the different brigade areas. And their role was, they were said, you're the last form of defense. That you're supported by the local companies of IRA who are in the Neil or in Turmikid or wherever they might be, but you're supporting, but these guys are essentially the elite and it's down to them. If the war is going to be won, it's going to be won by the flying columns. If it's going to be lost, it's going to be lost by the flying columns. It's down to them. And what the flying columns did is they increased their violence and their plans. And you can see here an example of their, their violence. If you came across an IRA man in 1919 in Mayo, during, uh, in 1919, more than likely he would point a gun, and you're an RIC man, for example, he'd probably point a gun at you, tell you you were um, to take off, your, take off your uniform. He would order you to resign immediately when you go back um, from, uh, the, uh, the, from uh, the RIC, and he'll probably take your gun off you as well. If you came across an RIC man in 1921, he would shoot, you would shoot him in the head. That's the difference. You can see here an example. Matt McCauley was a local leader of the North Mayo IRA, and he was, they, were working, they were actually operating in uh, Sligo at the time. 
And he said they planned an ambush. It was an ambush, I believe, on a barracks there. And they noticed that the, there were six local girls going out with six RAC men. And they decided if the girls got in the way, they would shoot the girls too. That was it. There was, in other words, the line was drawn. You're either with us or against us. Um, you also had a case where they captured two RIC men. One man they um, executed because they he had been. They reckoned he was part of a murder gang that he had been involved in that before, and they decided that they would kill him. But the second man, he said he was younger. You can read it there. We would like to let other RIC men go free. He was younger. He pleaded hard and he cried. And again, he pleaded with, with us. The, he was also shot in the head. The reason is he could he recognized them. They couldn't trust that he wouldn't go back to his barracks and implicate those men. So they left a choice. They couldn't take him a prisoner because they know where to bring him. So they decided to shoot him. That, without deciding the morals of it, but that's what's happening. You had literally that ratcheting up of violence, which got to the stage when you got to um, later 1921 into May, June, July 21. The violence is at a level which is unprecedented. And the pressure on the... Uh, on the runs which had formed the flying columns is huge because they're down to a situation where their ammunition and their guns and everything are, are at, a, at a low and there a lot of their members have been captured and the pressure on reprisals has come on the local community many in the local community are saying to them look lads don't don't put an ambush in our area whatever you do just do, do it somewhere else don't do it here for the love of god don't do it here and you can imagine a pressure where a young man again because they're young is now being asked by his father, look, I agree with what you're doing, but don't do anything in the kneel, or we're all going to suffer. They're going to they'll kill one of us. Don't do that. So what do you do? Because you can't, you obviously have to pick some place to put an ambush. So um, and in many cases, the flying columns are forced to take to the hills. And you have them, obviously, in Trumakidi is a good example of that, but also throughout the rest of um, West Mayo, North Mayo, they take to the mountains. And they actually, the RAF are used um, to try and locate them. So um, that brings us to towards the, the end of that. So essentially, you, you, you come to July of uh, 1921. You can see here, Stebbin in, in May, he, he rec they recognize this point that these are who are up to, up to May, actually, the flying columns were kind of almost mythical in a way because the RSC weren't too sure who exactly they were. Stebbin initially thought they were actually coming from other counties. They didn't realize they were actually men on the run from in Mayo. Um, but their information was good. And by the time of uh, May, he recognized that basically these fine columns go back to the very beginning of my presentation, that the sons of small farmers are small shopkeepers in the county. And that photograph there, I believe it's the North Mayo uh, flying column. Um, compare that to what you would recognize now as, uh, as uh, you know, soldiers. It's a ragtag bunch of men in looking at them. And yet the Republic depended on them. That was the last line. Because if they failed, it was over. Um, July 11th, 1921, not 2021, as I put there, which is a bit of a slight mistake. Um, so 1921, 11th of July, the British government call a truce. And the reason that happened is twofold. One is the reports of the reprisals and the activities of the black and tans and auxiliaries and the murder squads and that had reached a point where public opinion in both the UK and America was such that they couldn't, that the government were in serious trouble. You couldn't fight a World War I, although they did try, and claim to fighting for the rights of the small freedom of small countries like Belgium, and then turn around and commit the essentially war crimes that the auxiliaries and black and tans did and RSC did. And you find a situation where international pressure, especially from Irish America, was um, causing the um, uh, British government to think twice and force them into conceding. From a Michael Collins IRA point of view, they were down to their last few bullets. They were really up against it. And in many respects, the truce was greeted with, in most cases, relief. Relief by ordinary people, but also relief by a lot of IRA. Not necessarily maybe um, all of them, but certainly most of the IRA and certainly most of the IRA leadership recognized that this um, couldn't come soon enough. And um, also at this point, um, Michael Collins had recognized, as many did, it wasn't possible to defeat the, British, the Crown forces in Ireland. That wasn't possible. Collins had an idea of bringing it to UK, of bringing it to, bringing it to the mainland, 
as he saw as, as it was called. But in Ireland, they recognized the columns had done their, they're, they're doing the most they can. They made the country, the country ungovernable. And as a result, the British um, called a ceasefire on the 11th of July of <coughs> 1920, um, 1921. So um, that brings me to the end of that overview that I gave. Um, I suppose, uh, I'm not sure where I am on time. Joe might be able to tell me there on that one. I think I came in just a little bit, oh, a little bit over time. But um, so if any Q&A, um, I would take any, any, any questions you have. Um, I have a book which is called No Revolution, Engaging the War in North Mayo. It does contain a lot of information about Mayo in general, and it's available in Mayo Books. And um, uh, if you have, by all means, if you would like to buy it, that'd be great. Um, but also, as I said, I'm bringing out, um, I'm doing a PhD, but I'm bringing out more information as well on the general uh, war of war and independence and the following civil war as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to um, give this webinar and I hope I can uh, brought some insight into regards what the context of the war of independence was uh, for the Tumakiti ambush and other um, activities during the war of independence. So thank you very much. Thanks, Liam. Uh, thank you very much for that. Ramila uh, most interesting indeed. Um, as set out in our program, we have a few questions that have come in on the chat. And uh, the first one in was uh, Michal Linsky. Uh, he wants to know, uh, it used to be taught that the public reaction to the executions of the 1916 rising leaders is what led to the people joining the IRA. Are you saying that is not true? Um, yes and no. It's, it's a debatable um, nationalist history has been taught that essentially once people realized the 1916 leaders had been executed the way they had, that they immediately just turned and became uh, supportive of the Sinn Féin movement. Um, that's not true. Um, and it's part of the mythology that now people are realizing um, was being taught to us in school. Um, but what did happen was a combination of things I just mentioned, for example, immigration in Mayo in particular, they like the emigration and all that. But it is also true that Sinn Féin were, did teach about the, the men of 1916. And certainly in those Irish classes, um, in those concerts and those lectures, they would have talked about the uh, leaders of Park Pierce and that who had died and what they stood for. And these were heroes. So they did use um, uh, the mythology, if you like, or the, or the uh, martyr, martyrs of 1916. But that's not the reason why people joined the IRA. Um, if you look, when you look at it, it was a combination of many things, which included um, 1916 in the run-up to that. That's not to say some people didn't join because of 1916, but certainly the most of those people, those young men took to the mountains. They may say afterwards, if you met one of those men in the mountains, they say to them, why are you on the mountains? Why have you gone? Why, why did you take up a gun? They probably would say, oh, because of 1916. But that doesn't mean it's the reason why they did it. That's just the reason they're giving you, because that's what's inspiring them to, to, to be this way. So it's, it's more, it's like everything in life. It's more complicated than, than that, you know? Uh, thanks, Liam. I have a second question for you, and it's from uh, Paul Keenahan. Uh, what would have happened if the truth was called later, or indeed not at all? That's a big if, um, and the world, the, the most fascinating conversations can be ha happen around if. Um, Michael Collins recognised, I think by March or April, maybe a bit later, that the war could not be won in Ireland. And he decided that the only way to get the British to understand what war was about was to bring it to the UK. And he planned um, a bombing campaign um, in Liverpool to start with, I think. And that was so basically they recognised the war could not be won in Ireland. Um, public opinion was swinging very much against the British. There's a number of atrocities that happened that were really bad. The auxiliaries did some terrible things up in the, the Midlands, but other things happened around the country. And you had the um, Irish America also highlighting the, the things that were happening. And they were leaking out as well because people were, were writing to um, reporters are writing stuff and they were being now highlighted. And um, so Irish America was definitely turning against Britain. So um, Britain was kind of being forced to into a situation where they had to essentially do something. And Churchill himself, I think, was saying it, it wasn't worth the pocket of a small empire wasn't worth uh, over. Um, uh, bringing in laws which would, in a normal sense, overthrow a government because um, he felt that the empire was 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 worth preserving and, and Ireland wasn't. Um, there is also debate that the, the the what would happen the IRA point of view. I think 
the danger was, I think the film Michael Collins may have mentioned this, even though it's very, it's very mythological, myth, mythological in some ways, but they mentioned the fact that they had no guns left. I mean, you had situations where they literally had no bullets. They were doing everything, melting down um, bullets, try, or made, melting down uh, lead, trying to fashion bullets out of rudimentary materials and, and guns. So essentially, and you had internment as well. You had a lot of men just being interned. So the situation happened. The IRA were going to, were going to run out of uh, guns and they were going to be caught. Eventually, despite all the maneuvers they were doing on the mountains, they were eventually going to be caught. And if they got to winter, and if they had a bad winter, that probably would have finished them. But against that, you had a situation where the British government couldn't hold. A public opinion has swung against them and they couldn't wait to winter. So I suppose another month, another two months, what would have happened? It's a big if. But certainly... It wasn't, the IRA weren't going to do better. Um, it was probably going to a situation where they're going to do worse. And that's something that's, uh, it, they, they, they reached that point. And Michael Hans recognized that. Very good, thanks, Liam. I have another question for you from uh, Stephen Farragher. Uh, who were the people who didn't vote for Sinn Féin in 2018, who didn't vote? Th and that's a very interesting question because, uh, there was a significant amount of the country didn't vote. Now, because some contests like South Mayo didn't have an opportunity to, to vote against Sinn Féin, there was only one candidate. So it's hard to know what exactly the turnout would have been. But there was a significant amount of people. My own personal belief is in Mayo, take Mayo as, a, as, as opposed to the rest of the, the rest of the country. The people who didn't vote for Sinn Féin, by and large, are the people who became free staters. They supported the free state. I don't go along with the idea of a massive split in Sinn Féin movement. I don't believe that happened. I believe that in Mayo in particular, you had a number of people who did go from Sinn Féin to um, anti-treaty, went, went anti-treaty, uh, sorry, went pro-treaty. Most of the Sinn Féin movement, by far and away, the major way, 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 the majority of Sinn Féiners became uh, anti-treatyites. And those people who, who voted against Sinn Féin or didn't vote at all in the 1918 election voted for the treaty. And that's what Republicans were saying at the time. You go to the reports of Republicans and they're talking, they say that. They said one guy in particular mentions they, um, it caused the, the free stater, um, they all went, they, the, the priest on the pull he mentioned for some reason, he had some issue with the priest, I don't know what that was, but he, the priest on the pull, sorry father, he, <laughs> you asked the question, I'm telling you now. Um, the free stater, the uh, big farmer, and a few other people he mentioned, they all disappeared in the war of independence. And they re-emerged afterwards. They re-emerged when the coast was clear to vote against us. So he viewed that the majority of people voting against them were the people who had, vote, had voted in 1918 and then disappeared. That was his view. Um, so my view, basically, like I said, is though people who voted against Sinn Féin, they were the old Irish party, they were farmers, they were um, labour people um, who either stayed at home or voted against uh, Sinn Féiners. And they came back then and during the when the chance to vote on the treaty happened, they voted for the treaty. And they became Cumna Gael, and Cumna Gael then eventually became Fine Gael, and that's, that's, that kind of, that's that kind of route. Great, Liam. Thanks very much. I have one last one, if you can bear with us. Sure. Uh, it's from Nora McHugh. Uh, what happened to the IRA men when the Civil War was over, especially at the Flying Columns? What, what happened to those people? Again, this is a very good question. Um, What's interesting now, and I encourage everybody who has an opportunity to do so, is to go to the Bureau of Military History or the Military Archives um, and have a look there at the pension applications and the medal applications that veterans of the War of Independence made and see what they wrote. And that's very revealing because the pension applications are the ordinary, ordinary soldier, the ordinary farmer son who joined and took a gun and went to the mountains. They're not the leadership you know they're, they're the ordinary stories of men saying i need a pension because i've known i'm, I'm poor and I, I was involved in the war and they talk about what their experience was so what you find is um unfortunately in mayo again speaking of mayo in particular most of the iram a vast majority 90 percent of the um volunteers became anti-treaty um anti-treatyites and they took in the civil war again they took to the hills to fight against the free state and they lost and what you find is that they were very disillusioned when they lost. And 1925, the IRA, when they told them to dump arms in 1923, when they, um, 
they said, don't leave Ireland, hang around. The war is not over yet. So we, we, there's other means to fight. But then it became very apparent in 925 that the war was well over. The Free State had won and Northern Ireland was a separate country or a separate state uh, in a separate country and going to stay there that way. So there's a huge exodus of veterans of the war of independence. They let, 1925 onwards left and went to America in the main. And a lot of them just wore, swore never to come back. Um, so they, they left and, and never came back. And um, that's, that's what happened many of them. Um, the pension applications reveal a lot of disenchantment, a lot of, a lot of men who are very fed up. They, just, they describe conditions of having to lie in ditches for hours, how they developed pleurisy, developed pneumonia from it, how they were bad health the rest of their lives and never got any pension application because the state, the free state had no money. So when the free state, the company Gale were in government, they didn't want to give any uh, pensions to the other side. So the former IRA men who were in um, on the hills didn't get pensions approved by the, the free state government. When De Valera came in, a lot of, um, of these men thought they're going to get their day had come, that De Valera is going to make sure they're going to get their pensions and recognition for what they'd done. And again, they had no money. There was no money to give them. And De Valera's government was very niggardly in what they gave out because civil servants said, we cannot afford to give this money to these people. Otherwise, we're bankrupt. So in many cases, disillusionment is what happened to these people. They became very disillusioned with both the free state, very disillusioned. And also in 1920s, Ireland, 1930s, um, very econom economy went down the tube. It was very bad. You had the economic war um, that the De Valera had with, with uh, Britain. So um, very disillusioned. And an awful lot of these men is now recognized, they had PTSD. Um, a lot of men took to drink. Um, I've done a little bit of study on it and noticed that um, we don't recognize that now. In fact, PTSD is something of very recently. But if you've, as a young man, gone to the hills, the comradeship is, is great and you go to the hills, you're drilling every night, it's exciting, all the March of 1916, you know, meeting the women at the, at the concerts, you're the hero to the local you know, parish and everything. That wears off very quickly, especially when you have the blood of, a, of another human on your hands. And a lot of these men faced without any preparation. These aren't soldiers. They're not trained soldiers. I mean, they're, they're, they're idealistic. They drilled, but they learned themselves. And they ended up very scarred, both emotionally, physically. A lot of these men are in physically very bad shape. So I think now it can be recognized that there's a huge tranche of men, a lot of them who emigrated to the States, as I said, who just ended up... Um, very badly treated by society. Um, there was one man in, in um, my own uncle who read my book and he said to me, he recalled that actually one of the heroes in the book, as he called it, one of the, the men, ended up being a caretaker in a local vocational school and no one knew who he was. No one knew that he was involved in the, in the war and didn't know his involvement. I mean, he read the book, he only realized the first time I was heavy involvement and never would have thought to look at him. This quiet man who just kind of shuffled in, shuffled out. So despite the war of independence giving us our statehood, the men, the ordinary men who took to the hills of the Turmikides all over the country, um, never really got re you know, rewarded for, for what they did. And you can argue, how could they be? I mean, it was a difficult, I'm not saying they could have been rewarded. In a situation that would end up in a civil war, it's hard to see how that could happen. But like I said, the PTSD thing, the idea that these men were, were in many respects um, very disillusioned afterwards is certainly, if you read the pension applications, and read their, their letters where they're begging to get money, where they're begging to get recognition. And they're very disillusioned, both with Fine Gael or Comne Gael and Fianna Fáil. They're disillusioned with everybody. And um, later on in the 70s, 60s, 70s, when they're applying for medals, they frequently refer back to the very least I could get is a medal out of you. That, that of all I did, that the very least I could do is get a medal. And some men didn't even bother applying. They just didn't bother. So... I think we need to bear that in mind. And the PTSD thing is significant as well, before I finish. Sorry, now I'm dragging on a bit, but I, 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 I'll finish this one. Um, a lot of these men took to drink um, more than in my, I interviewed over 200 interviews um, throughout um, Mayo and in, in researching my PhD. And a lot of cases that I came across uh, family members who were called their uncle, uh, other father, who had been an IRA volunteer. Um, they're alcoholics. And... I think, I, I don't know, I'm not a sociologist, but I would suggest that that would be a direct result of their impact of their, their what they saw and what they did during the War of Independence. Um, these men took up shotguns against the greatest power the world had yet seen. The biggest empire, um, the strongest military, and they had shotguns on, on a boggy hill. And they fought them to a standstill. 
And yet the end result was these men ended up as caretakers in some cases, ended up emigrated into parts of North America and disappeared, um, or ended up just unfortunate alcoholics, sometimes violent men, unfortunately, took it out in their families. So I think it's sad, and I'm sorry, I don't want to end in a downer in that regard, so my apologies if I am. But I think we need to remember that side of things too, because um, that's the consequence. War, I can't remember who said it, but it was, I think it was, again, a Michael Collins movie, even though I'm not a fan of the movie as a historical narrative, but they talk about the, the war. And the problem with war is that war affects both sides, both the, both the oppressor and the victim are both tainted by war. You don't, you don't come out of it um, you know, innocent. Both, both are, are, are tainted. And that's the thing we need to remember. The war independence, we need to commemorate it. And that's a very good thing. We're commemorating it, not celebrating it. It's a commemoration. And it is what led to our statehood, but there was costs involved. And we need to remember what that was too. Apologies if I, if I took it down a bit in my, in my um, spiel, but I think it's important to be truthful about what, what I saw, you know? Okay, Liam, thanks very much. Uh, we might draw to a conclusion there. Uh, lots of other questions coming in on the chat, but we might forward those on to you um, and sure. to collect them up into, into groups and, and try and reduce the number. Um, on behalf of the uh, Turn McGee, the Ambush Commemoration Committee for the centenary year of 1921, I'd like to thank you most sincerely for your excellent delivery, excellent food for thought, seemed to be well researched, well prepared. Thank you. Uh, you've completed the inaugural uh, lecture of a series of lectures, which we've titled the Michael O'Brien series of educational lectures. Michael O'Brien being the man that was shot on the hill in Tormakidi, as you were now talking about people out in bogs and in hills and so on. So with that, Gurumila Mahakat, Agus Ganyayi Lat, Agus Bemajakantirish Lat Lakona Jay.